November meeting. And uh, we have an interesting speaker tonight. We've got a couple of housekeeping issues just before we get started. So uh, I'd appreciate people if you have your cell phones to turn them off so that they don't interrupt the presentation. There are, of course, washrooms in the back if you need to use them. And, uh, or if you could close that door or worry it's going to close the door, somebody's going to, okay. Uh, so in the event of an emergency, straight down the stairs, out the building. There is also an exit here for elevators should you have to use it, but I don't care. You don't try not to use the elevator unless you have to, because it tends to get stopped between floors. It's a bad thing. So I'm going to begin the uh, meeting with the first Nations Land Acknowledgement, which we always do. Uh, we respectfully acknowledge that the former village of Lakefield is located on the Treaty 20 Michisaga territory and in the traditional territory of the Michisaga and Chippewa nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaty's First Nations, which include Curve Lake, Hiawatha, Alderville, Skugog Island, Rama, Wasilu, and Georgina Island First Nations. The Lakeville Historical Society respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty's First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, and that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure the health and integrity for generations to come. Thank you. And Jackson want to do smudging before we get started. He'll explain what that is for those of you who don't know. Uh, Ami, thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm going to start things off with the smudge. Has anyone done a smudge before, just as a show of hands? No? Okay, we'll maybe do a little bit of a demo then. I think that's good. Um, grade 3 students can do it, so I think all of you can do it as well. Um, but if you don't want to smudge as well, you're also um, very free to say no when it comes around. But um, we typically start things off with a smudge, just to kind of clear the air, get out of kind of the negative uh, kind of thinking of the air, and also start us off uh, hopefully in a good way. And there's actually a lot of research now coming out that smudging is actually a very healthy practice. There's um, research showing it's very good for depression and mental health and anxiety. So um, it is, I think, something that will hopefully calm everyone down if anyone's nervous. I'm a little nervous because uh, this is the legion I kind of grew up in and it's weird to be up here talking rather than out there in the audience. So um, I'll start off with this, the sage and kind of show you what to do. And tonight we are smudging just white sage here. You can smell it as soon as I light it. Uh, and typically, too, we keep it in these uh, abalone shells. And these abalone shells are actually only from the west coast of Canada, and they're traded all across what is now um, North America, or Turtle Island, what we refer to it as. Um, and again, it is a very kind of sacred process, I would say. So the way that I smudge is that I'll light it, and then I'll kind of talk you through it as well. So, and then I can come around the circle and offer it to you if you'd like to smudge. And again, you can say, you know, I, I won't be offended. So um, I have my sacred barbecue lighter from my grandpa's house because I forgot one, so thanks. <laughs> glasses you can uh, I usually wash my glasses first in the smudge so I'll put that through uh, and then basically we bring this smudge to different parts of our body for different reasons so I'll bring it um, to my mouth to say good things tonight to my eyes to see good things uh, to my heart to feel good things and then to my head to think good things and then typically when you're done you kind of push it back to the person giving it to you and you just say make which uh, and we go around Usually a circle, this is not really a square circle, so I'll kind of go left and right uh, and go through that as I think we're going to start off the video potentially as I go through. Uh, so I'll be walking around if you'd like to smudge, you're welcome to. I think Mike has got us all together, all of his own. Mike, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Do you want to bring up the first one? Sure. Military history. Private Merlin Oliver Knott, active service, World War II. He was 19 years old when he enlisted in Kingston, Ontario. He was born at Curve Lake, Ontario on November 29, 
1924 and had no previous military experience. He completed grade seven at the Kerbalik School and was fluent in English and of the J. He was a laborer and employed at the Canadian General Electric Company in Peterborough, Ontario. He officially entered the service as a private on December the 1st, 1943, and after a month of basic training, on December 31st, 1943, he was transferred to number 31, Canadian Infantry Basic Training Centre at Cornwall, Ontario. Records indicate that Private Knott completed the end of training during basic training and it made better than average progress in the 10 weeks basic training, adjusting well to Army life. On May 15, 1944, he was assigned to Camp, Camp Ipperwash. Private Knott was deemed ready for overseas overseas duty in the Canadian Infantry Corps, and he arrived in England on June 10, 1944. About a month later, Private Knott was assigned to the Allied Armies in Italy. Twelve days later, on July 29, 1944, he arrived in Italy and was assigned to the 3rd Battalion Royal Canadian Regiment. Two months later, while fighting in Italy on September 3, 1944, Private Knott was wounded and was admitted to the number one Canadian General Hospital. After 29 days, on October 2nd, 1944, he was discharged, and by November 24th, 1944, he was back with the Royal Canadian Regiment in active service. Medical rec records indicate his wound was in the lower calf, left leg, and it exited the heel. The sole of his boot was taken off by the force of a bullet. To hurt. On March 8, 1944, Private Knott was transferred from the Central Mediterranean Force to France. He then fought to Italy, France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. May 8, 1945 was Victory in Europe Day, and Private Knott was still in his trench in Holland when the news came out that the war for Europe was over. While the battle against Japan was still to be determined, he received the Holland Medal for Veterans, which has Thank You Canada, 1945, embossed on it. On June 9, 1945, Private Knott returned to England, where he was assigned to the Canadian Army Pacific Force and the 2nd Battalion, 1st Canadian Infantry Regiment, with the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment. However, he never made it to the Pacific and Private Knott returned to Canada in September 1945 and was stationed in Brockville. September 25, 1945, note, Private Knott was absent without leave from 0615 hours on September 17, 1945 and still absent to 0615 hours on September 25, 1945. Eight days. For this he was arrested, jailed 20 days, and was fined 20 days of pay. The records don't indicate why he was absent. On November 9, 1945, Private Knott was assigned to the 7th Training Battalion in Peterborough. On January 23rd, Private Knott was assigned to the Canadian Ordnance and Electrical Me Mechanical Engineering, Battlefield, Ontario. On February 7, 1946, he was discharged from military service due to demobilization. He went home to Kirk Lake. He was awarded the following medals. The Canadian Aboriginal War Medal with Canadian Aboriginal War Veterans embossed on it. The 1939-45 Star, the Italian Star, the France and Germany Star, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal and Class, the Defence Medal, and the War Medal 1939-45. He also qualified for the General Service Badge Number 725722. In total, he served 11 months in Canada, four months in the United States, seven months in Italy, three months in France, and he served in Canada for a total of two years and two months. Now for some personal background. Merlin Oliver Knott was born in Curve Lake, Ontario, on November 29, 1924, son of Alan Knott and Margaret Maggie, Gladys Martell, and was raised in Curb Lake. He attended the Rural Public School in Curb Lake, completed grade seven, 
and then left school voluntarily in 1940 to work on a farm. He also worked as a general laborer doing bush work, cutting, trapping, etc. for two years. He spent his spare time hunting, fishing, and guiding. After returning home from the war, he married Isla McHugh, the daughter of Clayton Anderson McHugh and Bernice Tobico. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. <laughs> On November 9, 1946, they lived in Curve Lake where they raised their eight children. Stanley, Gwen, Karen, Nancy, Hannah, Daryl, Eric, and Marla. Over the years, he worked as a guard at the military, at the Mill Penitentiary, and worked on construction for eastward construction, as well as guiding, hunting, and trapping. He was a dedicated family man, as well as active in his community. He enjoyed telling stories and spending quiet time fishing. He passed away on July 13, 2006. He had these following recollections of the war. He'd never been any further away from home than Peterborough before the war. At first, he thought the Germans would look distinctly different from North Americans. I was surprised when I finally saw one up close, and he looked just like we do. He fought all his way through Europe with the Canadian First Division, serving in Italy, France, Belgium, Holland, and Germany. During those years, he never experienced any prejudice from soldiers or the people in those countries. He said, in the army, we were all brothers. Everyone would call me Young Knot, and nobody called me Chief. It was not until he came back home to Peterborough he experienced prejudice, he said. I went out looking for work in construction, but as soon as I heard I was from Curve Lake, I didn't get the job. During his time in Europe, he saw a lot of action and lost many friends. He crawled, recalled the night in the trench in Italy when he was firing a machine gun with another soldier, resting his head on Knott's shoulder. A German bullet, bullet struck the other man in the eye, killing him, missing Knott by inches. He was wounded in the foot by a sniper's bullet in Italy and crawled into a ditch with the latrine and mortar shells bursting all around him. Picked up by the Red Cross workers, he said, the next thing I remember was waking up in an airplane with so many wounded moaning and agony in both sides of me. He was out of action for six weeks, but returned to the Italian campaign. The war was horrible, but I liked the army, he said. My father, Al Nam, served in the First World War and talked of his travels, and I wanted to travel too. He remembered being pulled out of the front lines to serve as a guard for a visiting general. In 1946, Knott, still in the army, was chosen, chosen as a member of the Honor Guard at the funeral of the Canada's Governor General, the Earl of Athrone. He landed in Italy in 1943 and served on the front lines up to the Po Valley before Canadian troops were pulled out and sent to France, then Belgium and Holland. The people in Holland and Belgium treated us like family. The last trend, not Drug was a farmer's field near a haystack. I remember that trench well. The Dutch farmer came out and told us the war was going to be over soon, but we kept our heads down all the same. We were still on guard when the officer told us the war was over. He immediately volunteered to go to Japan, but was eventually sent to Canada in July of 1945. He would have turned 20 at the end of the fall of that year. Thank you, Nan. It was a good soldier. A good soldier. And I, I have to point out that one point where he got sent to jail. Now, picture yourself. The war is over. You're back in Canada. You haven't seen your family for four to five years. You go away for a week to see them. You come back. They put you in jail for 20 days. Um, Having been in the military myself, not to the same extent he was, of course, but a 20-day sentence for seven days absent without leave is extremely tough, especially for someone who served as an honor guard, who was, was such a, obviously a respected soldier. And I gotta think there's some prejudice behind it. That's I don't know, but I suspect there was getting that kind of sentence, and maybe that's you know something that we'll be talking about tonight a little bit. Jackson, 
to talk on that if you wish. I'm going to talk about Private Murray Mackenzie Wheaton, who served in World War II. We have a picture of him up there. He's obviously changed over the time. Murray Wheaton was 20 when he enlisted in the armed forces on August 8, 1942 in Kingston. Murray was born in Jimway, was born at Curve Lake on November 30, 1921, where he worked as a truck driver and electrician. On August the 8th, he began his training in Kingston, Peterborough, Berryfield, and by January 27th, he was trade qualified as a lineman, Group B, Grade 2. While still at Berryfield, he was granted permission to marry Miss Ella Eva, Georgina Taylor of Curve Lake on February 15th, and he married her in Bridge North, Ontario. Less than two months later, on April 4th, he was in the United Kingdom. And the next day, he reported to the number one Canadian Singles Regiment unit. Murray did become ill, and he spent two months in hospital. Beginning on December 17th, he was suffering severe flu symptoms. Obviously, it wasn't the Spanish flu, because it was World War II. But it was influenza, and it was something people regularly died from, even today. He eventually recovered, though, and two months later, on February 1st, he was back on duty. He's now classified as a lineman Group C, and after four months more training, he's stationed in France on June 16, 1944. The date's sort of significant because D-Day was June 15, 1944. Once in France, he installed a lot of telephone lines, at times was fortunate to narrowly escape several dangerous situations. Sigmund Wheaton was instrumental in running lines from Juno Beach to Brussels, Belgium, during the D-Day invasion and beyond. And there was the first day of D-Day, there was subsequent days too, so even though he didn't come on the first day, he's still considered to be a D-Day uh, veteran. Murray recalled a time when during the war, when there were three indigenous soldiers and they made throwing devices out of their own wisdom. It looked like something like lacrosse sticks. And they used these throwing devices to launch grenades into enemy tank turrets and other places from a distance which immobilized the tanks and killed a lot of the enemy. Apparently their invention could throw a hand grenade a hundred yards or more. And having had training with those things, if you can th throw them 25 yards with your own arm, that's very good, they're heavy. So it's a, they both, uh, all three of them uh, earned recognition and they got medals for inventing the device. On September 6, he was assigned to the number one Canadian repatriation depot until 1945 when he arrived in Kingston. A month later, on November 15th, Murray Wheaton was released from the military service to resume his personal civilian life. On February 8th, he was awarded the following medals. The 1939 to 1945 star, the France and Germany star, the defense medal, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal on CLASP, and the War Medal, 1939 to 1945. He also qualified for the General Service Badge. Murray had served for nine months in Canada, one year, two months in the United Kingdom, one year, three months in France, and he served his country for a total of three years and four months. On a personal level, he was born on November 30th in Curve Lake, and he had his education in Curve Lake at the Curve Lake School up to grade eight. Then he took extension work at the Curve Lake School to the grade 10 level, and finally went to the Pebro Collegiate Vocational School, PCBS, in Peterborough, completing grade 11 in 1936. He was 16 at that time. He spoke and read English and Chippewa fluently. He enjoyed hunting, fishing, and skating. He worked for about a year as a grocery and general store clerk for his father, then he worked at his farmer's co-op in Peterborough for about a year, driving a pickup truck to make deliveries. Then he got a job at the Canadian Electrical, Canadian General Electrical, repairing motors for one year. Following that, he put in footings for the West Clocks Company for Eastwood Construction. When that work ran out, Murray traveled to St. Catharines to make peaches and worked at the canning factory. During the same period, he worked for Red Pass Construction as a mechanic, fixing construction machinery and of Frank Coyle's garage as a mechanic. Murray and Alpha had 13 children. In the following order, Joanne, Dixie, Pearl, Daniel, Ellie, 
Althea, James, Alma, Lorenzo Dow, Wellesley, Mark, Lavina, Arnold, Mary, and Christopher. Thank God I never have 13 children. They deemed named tags. <laughs> All children are believed to be Lily living except for Lavina who died in about 2001. And that we wrote this some time ago, so I'm not sure whether that's still true. But in any case, Murray indicated that after his war service, he was interested in getting a job as a lineman. Well, telephone, makes sense, or for the hydroelectric company. However, after the war, he got a job with outboard marine in Peterborough for about 18 years. At a variety of jobs. He ran drilling machines, did varso washing of parts, honed cylinders. And in the 1980s, Murray went into the ministry becoming a minister of the Alderville First Nations Reserve Church, located at Highway 45, just south of Rice Lake, for about eight years. A well-rounded soldier who did his best for his country and family. Unfortunately, we don't have a picture of this. We didn't, couldn't find one online. Private George Taylor, World War II. George Taylor was 23 years old when he enlisted under the Militia Act at Kingston, Ontario on June 19, 1941. He was a resident of Curve Lake, Ontario and was born April 28, 1918. He had no previous military experience and on June 19, 1941, as a private, he began his basic training at Peterborough, Ontario. Less than a month later, Private Taylor completed the basic training, and on July 9, 1941, he was assigned the rank of gunner with the Royal Canadian Artillery at Kingston. After a further five months of basic training in Gamanoque, Ontario, he transferred to the 18th Field Regiment at Sussex, New Brunswick, and then to the 5th Anti-Tank Regiment, where he spent a month training in Petaloa. On March 19, 1942, he arrived in England, where he was assigned to the number three Canadian Artillery Reinforcement Unit. While waiting the D-Day invasion after Dirkic, Dunkirk, Gunnar Taylor was assigned to the Allied Armies in Italy as a member of the Canadian Mediterranean Force, and on November 8, 1942, he arrived in Italy and joined the 2nd Mediterranean Regiment. George was admitted to the hospital four times during the next month due to minor combat injuries. And on March 11, 1945, he was transferred to France. After the collapse of Germany on June 13, 1945, Gunnar Taylor volunteered for the Canadian Far East Force, CFEF. However, on June 17, 1945, he was found dead in Holland. Gunner George Taylor was buried at the, I'm not going to say this one right, the Winchman? Nibijan Canadian Military Temporary Cemetery. Plot 3, row 8, grave 18, June 30, 1945. Later, he was exhumed and reburied at the Gospel Canadian War Museum in Netherlands. Grave reference, 4, row A, plot 9. He was awarded posthumously the following medals. The 1939-45 star, the Italian star, the France and Germany star, the Defense Medal, the Canadian Volunteer Service Medal and Bar and War Medal, 1939-45. He was also awarded or service badge, class eight. He served for about eight months in Canada, one year, seven months in the United Kingdom, one year, four months in Italy, three months in the Western European theater of war for a total time of just under four years. Some history. He was born on April 20th, 1920 at Curve Lake, Ontario, the son of Dow and Eva Taylor. George enjoyed hunting and fishing. He completed grade seven before going to work. He spoke English and Chippewa. During the summers, George worked as a guide for tourists, but his main occupation was as a hunter and trapper from 1939 to 1941. He also worked for Dee Wheaton as a laborer in the general store for 10 years. 
1929, he worked for six months as a driller on highway construction for Crawley and McCracken of Burley Falls, Ontario. He also had limited farming experience harvesting in central Ontario. During the winters, he worked in lumber camps as a cooper and saw axe and cross saw work from 1926 to 1942 for Mr. R. Reed of Bob Cajun, Ontario. Short life, well lived. Thank you, Diane. And that's just a short sample of the many indigenous veterans that volunteered to serve in World War II and World War I. I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker for tonight, Dr. Jackson Penn. And he holds the uh, role of first postdoctorate fellow of Indigenous education at Queen's Faculty of Education. And Jackson is also from the Wolf Clan. His ancestral roots are in Alderville First Nation, where his great-great-grandfather served as chief from 1905 to 1909. His grandfather was a member of Alderville First Nation, but Jackson considers himself a mixed settler and a shipping educator, as he is originally from Peterborough, Ontario, placed at the foot of the rapids, and currently lives on the Sydenham Lake near Kingston, Ontario. Jackson graduated with a BA in History in 2015, the same year that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report was released. This report made multiple references to the Alderville Residential School in Canada which was one of the first residential schools and was used as a test case by the federal government to expand the system throughout the entire country. After completing both his undergraduate degree and Masters of History at Laurentian, Jackson came to Queen's University for his PhD in education with a focus on Indian day schools. When Jackson began his PhD in topic of Indian day schools, or residential schools as we sometimes call them, was under-researched, and it afforded an important connection with Jackson, his family, and his background. Jackson felt a calling to Kingston, as the indigenous people of Alderville were originally the inhabitants of Kingston and were forced to move to Alderville. The newly created Mendigo Orgatan Spirit Garden in Lake Ontario Park has been dedicated to Alderville in its connection to Kingston. The forcible removal of the original First Peoples in this area occurred in the 1840s, and Jackson describes that he wanted to come back to a place not necessarily as reclaiming, but as someone offering to add to the conversation. Engagement in this community is emphasized in the postdoctoral fellowship, and Jackson takes an active approach to this aspect of his role, providing workshops and training on indigenous research, methodologies, and ways of knowing, which include running indigenous graduate workshops, such as indigenous community-based research, indigenous data sovereignty, building research communities, preparing for indigenous conferences, and more. So I'd like to welcome Jackson Penn, and looking forward to what he has to tell us. Uh, Miigwech for that intro, you kind of took over my first three slides there, so I uh, appreciate that long-winded intro and the, the kind group. So thank you for inviting me tonight to speak about Indigenous veterans. This is not my research specialty, but it is something I've been passionate about, and hopefully I'll be able to teach you something uh, about Indigenous presence in not just World War I, World War II, but all conflicts that Canada uh, and previously Britain was involved in. So uh, I like starting off in the language if possible, so I'll introduce myself in the Anishinaabeg Nguyen and say Ani Bojo, Jackson Indigenous, the Indian Indonatum, Ngojuan Don Indonjaba, Ngojuan Don Indonjaba, Sindam Zaga and Don Inda, Michisagi Anishinaabeg Nuni Zaganosh. So what I basically just said is what <laughs> Mike said there was my name is Jackson. Uh, I currently live in Sindam Lake, just outside of Kingston, uh, but I was born and raised just outside of here in Peterborough, Ontario. Um, as well, I'm from the Wolf Clan and I have mixed ancestry that is both settler uh, and in Anishinaabeg. So, um, as, as well as Mike talks about a little bit, uh, kind of how I got into this history, I would say, is it all kind of comes back to this grade 10 history trip. And I, I've actually seen now that they've actually advertised for the 85th anniversary of Victory in Europe Day, uh, but I went to the 75th anniversary of Victory uh, in Europe Day uh, celebrations, which was uh, a really life-changing experience. I was always interested in history as a kid. 
um, but I never actually saw it kind of firsthand. So I went on this 10 day trip there at the end of April into May when it actually was Victory in Europe Day. Uh, and I've basically been to every single Canadian battle site in Europe as a result of that trip. It was somewhat a depressing trip, I tell people, because we just went to battlefield after battlefield after battlefield. Uh, but it gave me a good window into what a lot of Canadians and Indigenous people experienced overseas. So uh, we kind of started in Juneau and then kind of went all the way up uh, to where we had a kind of a final ceremony in Holland and we walked with the veterans through the town that they liberated and all the community members came out uh, and shared us on. You can see kind of the red Canada jackets that we have. So yeah, I went to a lot of those battle sites like Juneau Beach, Passchendaele, Beaumont Hamel, uh, the Somme, uh, Vimy Ridge obviously in that photo right there. Uh, and those experiences really made me want to go into history, which Around 2010 wasn't the most advisable thing. I was talking to Mike earlier that that was not a way to get money at all in 2010. That really wasn't any job opportunities, but um, I did so anyway. So as Mike said, I did a, a BA in history from Laurentian University, which I finished in 2016. And then I did an MA as well at Laurentian. And then I finished my PhD uh, in 2021, which was just two years ago on Zoom. So I do tell people I'm kind of a, a Zoom doctor, per se. I didn't do the, the final defense in person. It was on Zoom. And since I was the postdoc, I now moved to Trent University, where I've been teaching for the last year or so. Uh, and there, my title is Assistant Professor of Indigenous Methodology. So I basically teach the Indigenous research classes and the kind of big lecture hall classes, as you can see in that photo there, uh, down on the right-hand side. But uh, as I kind of talked about, I was really interested in history alone uh, and just wanted to do anything related to uh, Indigenous history. And when I came to Queens, uh, I started focusing on uh, the Indian Day School. So maybe this is another lecture, maybe you invite me back if you like this talk, and I can talk at length a very long time about Indian Day Schools. But if you're not aware, there was uh, this other kind of system alongside the residential schools called Indian Day Schools. Uh, and you can see by that map on our website, indiandayschools.org, if you want to check it out after this talk, or maybe during this talk, if you're a student on kind of a phone, I always say, you should go check it out. Uh, but you can see actually the wide distribution of the Indian Day Schools. There's over 699 across this country, uh, and we really don't know much about what happened in these schools. I've been working with Curve Lake First Nation and their chief and council over the last five years to hopefully write a book in the next couple of years about what happened there, but uh, you can see that was just one of the pins that extend far across the country. So if you do go to that website, uh, you can check out some more information about that. So as I said, this is not my main research, but it is something, uh, it's somewhat related. They talked about obviously Murray Vuitton there. He went to the Indian Day School, uh, same with that first veteran that was mentioned. So there are overlaps here um, that I think I'll hopefully share with you tonight. But uh, what I really wanted to stress tonight is uh, three stories. That's what I typically do on a lot of my uh, kind of presentations. I try to keep a a little organized so I'm not just blabbering on to you about historical facts, which I can do for a while, uh, and instead kind of break it down into these three categories. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Indigenous involvement in World War I, um, and then move on to an Indigenous commemoration of that same war, the Great War, with an example of Alder for the First Nation and what's kind of gone on there, unfortunately. Uh, and then number three is an Indigenous involvement in World War II. So you'll see as we go through the slides that hopefully they'll all connect together in the end here. But um, what I also like showing as well as uh, this kind of concept, and we really try to stress this to first year students as well, is that uh, everyone comes in and talks about their history has a bias, and I think that's okay. I'm very biased to one side of the story, and I'm gonna tell you the stories that I've learned tonight. Um, you might agree with them, you might not, but these are just the stories that I believe are true, uh, and hopefully they might come to your, you as well. So this quote is by Richard Wagamese, who's a really famous Anishinaabe author, he sadly now passed away in his book, Medicine Walk, and I think this quote is really inspiring for hopefully what I'll do tonight. So it says, quote, all that we are is a story from the moment we are born to the time we continue on our spear journey. We are involved in the creation of the story of our time here. It is what we arrive with, it is all that we leave behind, and we are not the things we accumulate. We are not the things we deem important. We are story, all of us. So hopefully you'll see maybe some of your own history, and if you have any uh, veterans in your own past, even though they're not indigenous, you might see similar stories uh, tonight. But these are the ones that I know. And the story that I really like to start off with is this photo. And maybe you ask audience, has anyone seen this photo before? Or know where it's from? I know Mike, a few people are nodding their heads. Yes, this is 
a very kind of well-known photograph. Uh, it's actually now held at the National Art Gallery of Canada. Uh, and it's actually painted by Benjamin West, who painted a bunch of different kind of war scenes. And as you can see, this is a very 1700s war scene. Uh, and in many ways, we could talk about, I could talk about this painting for a very long time. There's lots of kind of hidden things in the background, and he was actually present in this scene. Uh, but in many ways, historians now are really considering that the war that they were fighting was the First World War here in the 1700s. So if you ever heard, it's kind of used to be called the French and Indian Wars, and now it's referred to as the Seven Years' War. Uh, and you can say that was the First World War because every single continent except Antarctica saw some type of battle that happened. And here in North America, it was between the British and the French, well, it was the British and French throughout the whole world, but especially here in North America. And this battle, what the painting actually depicts actually, uh, is a very final battle between the French and Eng French and uh, the English, obviously, yeah, the French and English. So uh, this is taking place in September 1759, uh, and there shows this guy kind of dying on the side. Is there a laser pointer on this mic, or? Oh yeah, there is, okay, perfect, I got the laser. Okay, so that shows right there, that is um, actual General Wolfe. Uh, and the Redcoats, who were the British. And it's really this romanticized photo, obviously, of him passing away. Uh, but if you don't know, this final battle happened just outside of Quebec City on the Plains of Abraham. Uh, and what basically happened was the British scaled this massive kind of stone wall uh, and came over the side of the rock uh, and took France by surprise and completely kind of wiped out their military. And after this, really the entire history of our country can be linked to Britain because of this one battle here and all the ramifications that happened as a result. And interestingly about this photo is that every single person that's standing or sitting down right here with General Wolf can be named. And there is one person that's not named. And I'm sure you can maybe guess who it is. It is this uh, indigenous man right here who's in somewhat of a thinker pose. We actually don't know who that person is. But in reality, and what I like to talk about, especially to first year students, is why is that the case? Why don't we know that history? Uh, and for some reason, they didn't actually mark him down. Uh, and that's despite the fact, if you look at all the archival records of that battle, uh, is that actually the British would have lost without their allies that were indigenous people. So indigenous people sided with the British in this conflict, especially the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe. And a lot of the battles that happened all throughout basically this area where we're standing, including down by Fort Henry and Kingston, uh, were all aided by the Anishinaabe allies, allies that they had. And unfortunately, that history has not really been told, and I think why we really overlook indigenous history a lot uh, is because these characters, we don't actually know their name, even though they played a very significant role. And obviously, they're put in the painting for a reason. Uh, it shows him looking equally to actually Wolf, and that's what it is depicting. If you think of Wolf Island outside of Kingston, that's who it actually named after is General Wolf. So uh, General Wolf there actually passes away, but Britain is ultimately successful and it changes the course of this entire continent. There's, I won't go into the whole treaty history here, but a few years later, there's a 1763 Royal Proclamation, which declares that all land in North America is indigenous, unless you enter into treaties with those indigenous peoples. And I think it's important to recognize that every single conflict since this one, all the way back in the 1700s, that indigenous people played a very active and present role, and not just in the First and Second War, uh, basically every single conflict, including the War of 1812, which we won't get into tonight, but they had a massive role in that um, occupation. You could say the Americans maybe have taken over here if they weren't involved. So what I'm going to start talking about tonight is a little bit on the World Wars and uh, showing you the amount of people that actually were involved. So in the First World War, more than 4,000 indigenous people served in uniform during the conflict and one in three able-bodied men would volunteer who were First Nations at that time. Indeed, some communities, such as the head of the Lake Band in British Columbia, saw actually every man enlist between the ages of 20 and 35, which was kind of the prime ages to join uh, in that conflict. And you can see one of those photos there with an actually an entire Indigenous battalion. So at least 3,090 First Nation soldiers enlisted in the Canadian military in the Second World War, with thousands more Métis, Inuit, and non-status Indian soldiers serving without official recognition of their indigenous identity. And as, before we get into a lot of their stories tonight, I'd like to stress that as well, is that for a long time it was not um, really acceptable to be indigenous, I would say, and people claimed that they were not indigenous on their enlistment form, so that they were not given kind of that moniker. So there's actually thousands more, we believe, who were actually indigenous, uh, but they didn't write that when they enlisted because they didn't want to be recognized uh, as indigenous people in the early 1900s here for a variety of reasons. So 
And there was uh, a lot of kind of reasons as well when they first signed up. This was one where maybe you didn't want to say you're Indigenous because of this background. Uh, so there was really inadequate health care and schooling for Indigenous populations in the early 20th century. And as a result, very few could actually meet the strict medical and demanding educational standards of the Navy or the Air Force. So instead, they were forced to fight in the Army. And as we saw, all those people that just were introduced were all Army veterans and not in kind of the more you could say pristine, I know that's controversial, but the prestigious ones where you're flying complicated planes or driving submarines, for instance. They basically just went to the front lines when they signed up. And all, actually, 72 Indigenous women are also known to have served overseas in a variety of roles. So women also played a big role here on the home front, but also over in Europe. And as well, Indigenous people actually donate tons of money and humanitarian and to patriotic causes. So they participated in drives to collect strap metal, rubber, bones, even from old buffalo drums. They'd actually go back at west and find actually all of the remains of buffaloes that were left. Uh, and those are also donated to make a whole bunch of different things like gunpowder, for instance. As well as they conducted public and ceremonial expressions of support and loyalty and worked in a huge amount of war industries at that time in unprecedented numbers. It was really uh, a total war effort for both of these conflicts. So uh, what I really want to stress as well is that the both rulers is kind of a misnomer, I would say, is that uh, they really hardly did anything to increase indigenous civil rights at home. And there was really a higher chance of being enfranchised and increasing any other rights. So as you, if you did sign up to be indigenous, when you delisted from the military, you could lose your status as an indigenous person. Uh, and a lot of people think that after the First and Second World Wars, Canada kind of learned from what happened overseas. Uh, but I personally don't believe that's 100% accurate. I think there's a lot of things that we learned, but there's also a lot of things we instantly forgot when we came back um, from Europe here going forward. And also, I'd like to stress as well is that the treaty process, we're technically all treaty people here in Ontario, we're all connected to the treaties in some form or another, and sadly, they were also not followed during the wartime process. So, this is actually a petition of the Six Nations clan mothers to King George V uh, in 1917, which is the same year they started the conscription process. Indigenous people were happy to join the war, World War I, but they were not in favor of conscription whatsoever. Uh, and what they really refer to in this petition, as you can see, uh, is the early kind of treaty agreements between the French, uh, actually, these, this one's the Dutch and the uh, um, Haudenosaunee, but also the Haudenosaunee uh, and the British as well right here. So these two wampum belts is what they're called now, uh, were actually lifelong kind of treaty agreements that were supposed to be followed as long as the, the rivers run and the sun shines and the grass grows. That was really the intention of these treaties. Uh, and this one right here in particular is the two-row wampum, and that one is very significant, and that's the one they actually use in their petition. And why they did that uh, was because basically when they first came here, the Dutch, they agreed with the Haudenosaunee's that each line of this kind of row would represent their own culture and their own ideas. So uh, the Haudenosaunee's would have one boat on this kind of stream, and then the British and the Dutch would have one boat as well, and that they were never supposed to intersect those boats. That, their, their affairs and their political orders would all stay separate and that obviously when they called for conscription that overlapped that treaty and it broke down that treaty promise. So these clan mothers all got together and made this petition to the king trying to say that First Nations, in particular the Six Nations, would not follow the conscription policies. Obviously they were eventually overruled but can clearly show how indigenous people were actively aware about their treaties uh, and also were heavily engaged in a lot of the conversations that were happening uh, at that time. So again, try to remember that as we go forward as well, that Indigenous people were really willing to fight in these conflicts, they just didn't want to be forced to a European war that maybe necessarily was impacting them day to day in their First Nation uh, reserve. So I'm going to play this quick video. It's not easy to find the final resting spot of one of the most decorated Indigenous soldiers in Canadian history. Francis Pegamagabo the Sniper would have likely wanted it that way. Where there is no doubt is that he would have found this quiet corner of the Wasoxing First Nation near Perry Sound peaceful, free from the horrors of war and politics of a country that all but forgot what he did. I would say his story may have been sleeping. It was a story that was, you know, told um, in quiet settings uh, within his family or from amongst community members. He was known as Peggy to his fellow soldiers and a terror to the enemy. During some of the most horrific battles of the First World War, some, Ypres, Passchendaele, 
he would sneak into no man's land and wait. His patience led him to being credited with 378 kills and over 300 enemy captured. And after four years on the front lines, he was discharged with $898.68 in pay. He was happy to return to the shores of Georgian Bay, but like most indigenous veterans, he had hoped for a newfound respect. Instead, it was more of the same, poverty and persecution, and the country he fought and bled for still wouldn't grant him citizenship. They were trying to prove themselves as equals, not to assimilate, but to prove themselves as equals as indigenous men, as indigenous Canadians. Pekamagabo never did stop fighting working tirelessly to get more autonomy for band councils. Until he died in 1952, he dedicated his life fighting for Indigenous rights. Of course, he returned a, a decorated military hero, but it was that work he did at community levels, at organizational levels, at uh, you know being a warrior for the rights, for the language, for the culture of his people. Uh, those are the active contributions that I think we most know him for. In Wisoxing today, the name Francis Pegamagabo is revered in both Ojibwe and English. He was one of 39 Canadian soldiers awarded the military medal and two bars for bravery. But it took until 2016 before he was immortalized in bronze, strong and defiant, on the shores of Georgian Bay. A hero given his due. Mike Trollick, Global News, Perry Sound, Ontario. That today to show Francis Peggy Mugabo and really his legacy that has happened here. Obviously, has anyone heard of him before? Just as a show of hands, yeah. Okay, I'm glad you have heard of his story. Um, it is now being well known. If you could do go to Perry Sound, I encourage you uh, to check out his monument going forward. So um, this takes us kind of to kind of my ranting section, I would say, of the lecture uh, and talking a little bit about some of the experiences I've had trying to learn this history because a lot of ways. Uh, indigenous history has been obscured in some ways has been completely I think erased in a lot of cases and I think this example will hopefully show you the so, uh, when I was doing my master's degree I was required to read this book and has anyone read this book before it is it was a very popular book at the, in the late 1990s uh, and it was called Death So Noble Memory Meaning uh, in the First World War so this one was written by Jonathan Vance uh, and won a bunch of awards there, as I said, in the, the late 90s. So it actually won the 1997 Sir John A. Macdonald Prize from the Canadian Historical Association for the best book in Canadian history. It also won the 1997 J.W. Defoe uh, Foundation Book Prize for distinguished writing that contributes to the understanding of Canada. Uh, and Jonathan Vance used those two awards to really propel the rest of his career. He's still actually teaching at Western University, and this book is now basically mandatory reading if you're learning about Canadian history and trying to talk about the First and Second World War. So eventually, actually, Jonathan Vance, because of this book, uh, was actually granted an inaugural Canada Research Chair in Conflict and Culture, uh, which is basically the highest, I would say, award you can get as an academic. You only have to teach two courses a year, and you also get $100,000 a year for research. So he received almost a million dollars to do research there in the early 2000s. Um, but unfortunately, when I was reading this book, I came across some very troubling um, words he wrote in this story, and I'll see how he's continued to say that story moving forward here since the late 1990s uh, about Indigenous people. So, oh, come, okay. So, yeah, so what he really argued in his book was this very Eurocentric thesis, I would say. So he dove into archival records and looked at various World War I monuments, commemoration events, poems, music, and letters, to conclude that a united national myth evolved as a way for survivors to cope with the First World War. And this myth was really entirely centered on Anglo-Saxon ideals that remember the war as a noble and worthy sacrifice, and hence the name of the book, Death So Noble. So um, in honor, really, of a, and he argues, of a higher power, which was this Christian god that could be seen really throughout all of the war memorials in Canada. And if you think of a, most of the cenotaphs, I think the one just down the street here in Lakefield, a lot of the time they have this type of imagery. If you look, almost all of them do, and that's what his book kind of concluded, is that that's how they remembered the war, is with this cross, sometimes with angelic features, and typically this was placed in the center of the community and really was a uniting thing for most Canadians uh, that saw their ancestors on this monument. And really for the first time in Canadian history, we could identify ourselves 
as Canadians that were separate from Britain at that time. So that thesis was kind of upheld for a very long time, uh, but he also discounted a lot of other monuments that didn't actually fit this narrative. And one of them was nearby uh, in Aldeville First Nation. So uh, I remember reading the book and coming across this page. It was about the 180th page. I wish it was kind of in the early pages. I want to stop reading it, but it was near the end of the book. Uh, and this is what he writes about the Alderville War Memorial. And I immediately recognize this, obviously because it was from Alderville First Nation, and I do have a family connection to people on the plaque there. Uh, and what he said, unfortunately, you can see is somewhat of a backhanded compliment, or you could call it chirp, or uh, kind of, I would say, joke in some ways. I don't really know what to call it, but you can see he was not actually placing the significance on this monument that I thought he should have. So he said, quote, the Bizarre Memorial in Campbellford, Ontario, was it intended as a monument or an advertisement for the stonemason who erected it? And unfortunately, one is not in Camford. If you know Aldeville, it's about 30 kilometers the other direction. So one, clearly he uh, was wrong about the geo geography of the site. And number two, obviously that backhand statement of basically, this was not really a monument. This was just basically something that a stonemason wanted to do because he had some time and money. Uh, and unfortunately, he uses that rationale as a way basically to not count the monument. He says this one doesn't include, uh, doesn't really match all the other ones, so I'm not actually going to consider it whatsoever. So there was really two different perspectives, I would say. In his actual book, he writes further on about it, basically saying the exact same thing that's under that image. He says, one especially bizarre design exists in Camelford, Ontario, a massive column with three huge orbs suspended from a cube top platform. It is less a war memorial than a monument to the ingenuity of the stone base that assembled it. So again, very clearly saying that this is not really a war memorial, it's just something that people made just because. And unfortunately, on the other side, if you actually went to the site, which I'm pretty sure he didn't go, uh, if you look at the picture, it's actually J. Peter Vance, which I found out was his father, so I think his dad actually went and took the photo of the site, and maybe that's why there's a mix-up with Camelford. Uh, you can see what Aldeville actually said. So if you actually went and read the plaque, this is what it says. Um, it, it says, the cube on the very top symbolizes the four corners of the earth, the three globes beneath the cube symbolize the Holy Trinity. The three large pillars supporting the above symbolize the three holy virtues of faith, hope, and charity. The square base on which the cenotaph stands represents the four freedoms of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from fear, and freedom of the press. The nine large cubes that are situated around the cenotaph, which you can't really see in this photo, uh, represent the nine men who were killed in World War I from Alderville First Nation. And the chain that is comprised of 35 links that encircles the cenotaph and is fastened to the nine cubes represents the 35 residents who served in World War I, and at the same time represents eternity. So really, a much different meaning to that monument, obviously, if you just were to read the plaque. So that's basically kind of history 101, just to read what people wrote about these monuments, uh, and you would have got that actually correct. And uh, unfortunately, this has had some damaging impacts, I would say, on how this site has been remembered, especially in the historical literature. So uh, Vance has had, as I kind of talked about, a lot of power to talk about this history. He was kind of the leader on First World History. I really looked up to him before I had read more about his work. Uh, and actually, just a few years ago, I was able to track down this video where he speaks as a key, keynote speaker at the Canadian War Museum, which was actually commemorated the First World War and almost 100 years after the battle had concluded. And um, you can probably guess what he's going to say. I'll play the quick video here. Gamut from the bazaar. Like this one in Alderville, Ontario, which uh, I have no idea what the symbolism means, but it's a tribute to the skill of the stonemason who put it together. <laughs> um, they run the gamut from the bazaar to uh, the deeply touching. Like this little one in uh, Chesley, Ontario, to the boys in Geneva Church School who fought in the Great War, 1914-1918. So looking at these memorials that were erected across the country, in the 1920s and 30s, one can only be struck by their variety. Now, if there was no agreement on what a memorial should be, there was unanimity on its purpose. To create a memorial, no matter what it looked like, was an act of devotion, love, and gratitude. It was a tenet about Indigenous people. And again, what he was actually missing, though, in reality, was so much. And I think he could have actually made a full book 
uh, but what he was actually missing instead of just kind of overlooking this one site. So what it actually represented was the first indigenous war memorial in Canadian history, which alone I think is worthy of remembering and talking about. Number two, that it was a symbol of peace and freedom, not just Anglo-Saxon ideals. You remember the freedoms, the four freedoms it suggested. It was actually community-led and constructed with $800 in donations from Aldeville First Nations themselves. Uh, the federal government actually refused to help the community actually build the war memorial. Uh, so basically everyone got together in Aldeville and said, who's good at co concrete? And one person came up and made the concrete stuff. They also had a lot of community members that came, uh, such as women that served lunches over a period of about two weeks. Uh, and again, donated their own money to construct this site. So obviously this was important for them and they believed it was something to be remembered. Uh, and it wasn't really controlled by the government either at that time. So. As well, the members of the band at Aldeville had one of the highest per capita enlistments in Canada in World War I and World War II. Nearly all actually men of active service age actually went overseas to fight in that war. So again, clearly this was a very important monument to the people in Aldeville. Uh, and again, this is actually a photo from my grandfather's collection back I think in the 60s or so. Maybe he was going to the site. Uh, what they really talk about as well that these monuments become more than just a monument, right? They actually become really a center of the community. So what one, one community member remarked in 2013 that over the last four generations, the monument has acted as a beacon, a meeting place, a destination, a point of solemn reflection, and a hallowed center of our community. It bestows upon us a responsibility to look up to it and be reminded of the sacrifice that it represents when half or more of the able-bodied men in this community signed up for service in 1914 in 1915 to serve overseas. So again, very clearly we've got stuff wrong as historians and there's more work I think to be done to actually tell an accurate history of indigenous people. And uh, I've tried to do that. I wrote this article on active history where you can read more about it. There's some good comments there from some relatives who wrote questions about the Oliver War Memorial, uh, but you can read more about it online. And uh, I know for a fact that Jonathan Vance has seen that article, but he won't respond to my emails to this day. Uh, I know a few of his students now uh, that we've talked about it, and he's definitely aware, but he has not made any updates. So if you ever see Jonathan Vance, send him my regards, and maybe send him uh, an email or two after this if you'd like. I say that to first year students, and they actually will, though, so I have to be careful a little bit. So um, maybe not if you're angry, maybe wait for tomorrow. But uh, what I think it also showed as well uh, is that actually these two people are also included in the war memorial. So the person on the side there was my great-great-grandfather Moses Morrison. Uh, and then on this picture here on the left-hand side is actually Fred Morrison as well. And both of these guys were included on the war memorial. And what's interesting about that, I find, is that they're actually, when the memorial was constructed, no longer indigenous under the Indian Act. So technically they had really no right technically officially to be on the Alderville War Memorial. They had lost their status through enfranchisement. Uh, but as a result of this, the community, they weren't really controlled by the government. They have both of those names there on the War Memorial, which I think is very deeply touching and shows that the definition of Indian to their community was defined by themselves not by the Indian Act, which was very punishing at this time. And uh, I've looked a lot at this photo, and I can't confirm it, but this photo right here is actually Fred Morrison, or my grandfather's dad here in the audience tonight, duck hunting. Uh, and you can see the rifle that he's actually using is a bolt action rifle that looks very like the ones that were given to him in World War II. So I think he might have brought that gun back from World War II and then used it for duck hunting, which I don't think it's legal now, but I think that's what he did and it works. So you can see the ducks that they have. And again, showing this history that there's real life people that obviously were impacted uh, by these comments and continue to be. I think we need to correct the past uh, moving forward. And in 2021, I've been following Jonathan Vance quite often. What he's doing now, he's somewhat in retirement, I would say. Uh, but he also was actively involved uh, in this question that was going on quite heavily in Kingston there. So I was there actually when they took down the Sir Johnny McDonald statue. I was there when they took down Sir Johnny McDonald pub, which is a big deal in Kingston. And also when they changed the law um, building there in Kingston. So I was there kind of right for a lot of these really heated discussions that were going on. And as a result of this, a lot of, I would say, old time historians or people that were upset about the way this history was being depicted uh, signed this expert statement. So over 130 experts came together and basically defended Sir John A. McDonald's legacy. Uh, and you can guess that number 124 was Jonathan Bates. So again, I think showing you how he did not really understand indigenous history and understand how that this times are changing right now as we move forward uh, 
uh, into the future. And again, this is just one example, I think, of lots of other ones where history has not been actually kind to Indigenous people and the same sacrifices that they made uh, in comparison to other Canadians at that time. So, I'll keep going. Okay, so uh, I'll just go back here for a second. So I'm going to transfer now just into World War II and talk a little bit uh, about Tawny Prince and some of those experiences as well, who was another decorated uh, Indigenous war veteran. So I'm just going to play this quick. Uh, The Army really treated me wonderful, right from the start. Right from the start. After I joined the Army, I learned something. They taught me something. How to survive. The captain that was on the other end said, uh, uh, Who's that out there walking around? I told him, I said, that was me. I said, the land was cut as I went and fixed it. Well, he says, you're a bigger fool than what I thought you were. <laughs> I just laughed. <laughs> I just laughed while I had to do something. I still have the dreams. I guess I'll never forget. I wake up and sweat and no, I'm telling you, it's, it's just like being in it right over and over again. Yeah, I wake myself up from yelling sometimes. To me, I think it was worth what happened. a lot of men. There's a lot of them walking around with just one leg. A lot of them walking around, just one arm. While you start thinking about these things, when you hear that taps on everybody's side, there's a, a thousand, a million pictures goes right through your mind and your own mind right there. passed away homeless, basically with no money on the streets uh, of Winnipeg and suffered quite heavily from alcoholism after he returned back from the service uh, and again tried to fight for indigenous rights but really came up to being no longer a citizen actually when he came back to serve uh, his country from the Second World War. Uh, and what I really want to share tonight as well is that there was a lot of descendants actually of Chief Pegasus. He was from Pegasus First Nation. Uh, this is actually a picture of Tommy Prince there on the left hand side. Uh, and that's actually his cousin who I worked with. His name was Elder Raymond Mason. He passed away just last year. He was a, a massive advocate for residential school survivors. Uh, and he told me a lot about his experience in the military as well and how it was very similar to Tommy. You can really see in this picture how closely related they are. Uh, they look like brothers in this photograph, but it's about 20 years after uh, between these two images here. Uh, what Ray really told me about uh, his experience is that a lot of other people experienced the same thing as him. So he went to residential schools between the ages of 6 and 18 and through some of the worst residential schools in Canadian history, which was Berto Residential School, Portage the Prairie, and Dolphin McKay Residential School, all in Manitoba. Uh, and basically, he left the military, I mean, left the residential school, he immediately signed up for military service. And that is a story that's been told time and time again now from residential school survivors. Uh, and I remember him personally telling me actually that the reason that he did join the military, basically on the third day after the residential school, uh, was that when he was growing up in these schools, he actually didn't know that you had to pay for rent, that you had to pay for clothing, that you had to pay for food. All of those things were provided in the residential schools, albeit I would say very terrible amounts of food and clothing and housing. Uh, but those things were provided. So this was basically a path 
for thousands of residential school survivors to go into. And in some ways, you could say that was a, kind of a mark of the system or design of the system uh, because there was a very heavy cadet presence as well. So they kind of got the militarized from a young age and then instantly kind of walking uh, into that military service. So he also served uh, in the 1960s. He joined the Canadian Armed Forces in 1968. Uh, but actually he had, uh, it was honorably discharged after two years due to a racist incident. Uh, it's in his book if you want to read it, it's a much more detailed explanation of what happens. Basically he got called a few horrible names and got into a fight and then served, I think it was 40 days in Valcarche military prison, which also was not the best experience whatsoever to go into that. And uh, unfortunately as a result of these experiences, he struggled as well, like Tommy Prince, with alcoholism, domestic violence, the justice system, he was in and out of course for about a period of 10 years, as well as being homeless. And I won't go more into race story, but he did turn his life around, uh, and he was ultimately successful in suing both the federal and Ontario governments uh, for over $5 billion for the residential school and Indian Day School settlement. So uh, he was quite successful. He founded this organization in 1986 called Spearwind, which would become the largest residential and day school organization uh, in Manitoba. So again, just another story of Indigenous people and their service in the military and how it wasn't always easy, especially before and even after they left uh, service to resume their own life. So as we're at the Legion today, I also wanted to comment a little bit about some of the things that have happened as a result of policies in the past. Uh, and many people don't know actually that when the men came back over after the First and Second World War, that they were actually not allowed in the legions. And that wasn't actually a legion rule, that was actually a rule by the Canadian government that was enforced through the legion. So what it talks about here, and this is actually on the legion site, they've actually acknowledged this and have tried to make um, some amends, I would say, with Indigenous people in their presence, but it said, what negative that came after amazing contributions of Native soldiers made to our nation's war efforts through their gallant service and service in general is how they're treated by veterans associations and societies as a whole. An Aboriginal veteran was not allowed to share a toast in honor of lost comrades with fellow veterans in a Royal Canadian Legion until 1951, and only if the province where the Legion was located allowed this. This it also included Remembrance Day, if you complete that. Uh, and it wasn't actually until the mid-1990s that Native veterans and families were also authorized by the Legion to lay wreaths or have their own form guards at the National War Memorial in Ottawa on Remembrance Day. So prior to 1951, it was illegal for Indigenous people to drink alcohol and also be in a vicinity such as the Legion where there is bar service going on. As a result of that, a lot of Indigenous people weren't immediately going into the Legion as a result, or they lied about their status and said they were not Indigenous people. That might have happened here as well, because I know Fred Marston became president of the Legion quite often right after that. So again, they kind of skirted the law in some ways. Uh, but you can see how that would obviously impact you. You obviously were from the type brotherhood after going to World War II, being the Nazis, having this amazing victory in all of Europe celebrating you, and then you come back home and you can't even have a drink uh, with your friends after the war. So this again is a legacy that I think Indigenous people are still dealing with, and maybe some of their reasons why they're not so active as now with the Legion, but maybe in the future that'll be something they continue to participate in moving forward. So. I also wanted to just, as we wrap up, talk a little bit about um, today as well and how there are still some ongoing problems with the military and Indigenous people. So um, recently there was a big report that came out in 2016, it's still being kind of updated. And I know quite a few Indigenous military members that have either served or are currently serving that now go to Trent University and have talked about some of their challenges that they still face up until this day. So Lieutenant uh, General Marquise Hines stated, we strongly believe that there's a systemic issue within the Department of National Defense and Canadian Armed Forces, and that is rampant throughout all ranks and elements of land, air, force, and navy. And this issue is serious enough that an external review is intimate. And this was what the review was based on that. Again, they found systemic racism that was kind of basically throughout the entire military system from the young age to cadets to as soon as they retired. The report also stated that this is not the military our Aboriginal members have signed up for, and this is not the military that they dedicated their lives to. Victims are being forced out of the military, yet the aggressors continue on, some excelling at their careers. So again, I don't think all of the issues have been uh, remedied, I would say, in our treatment of Indigenous veterans, uh, but clearly there's report and work being done as we speak right now uh, to hopefully correct some of these issues moving forward uh, into the future. So 
As we wrap things up, I also wanted to talk a little bit about Lakefield here as well, and about a tale of two villages, I think, and just show a little bit about the plaques that have been around this area. So um, we do this plaque project in 1001, which is now an ICR course at Trent University. So every single student that comes to Trent has to take my course. So if you know some of Trent, they might have taken this course. And it's basically a foundation to Indigenous knowledge. And one of their assignments we ask them is to go to their homeland territory or where they grew up uh, and look at some of the plaques. And you can find a lot of issues with these plaques. And unfortunately, there are, I think, one in Lakefield that potentially could be considered to be updated. So um, there are also some good examples as well. Just actually a couple summers ago or last summer, uh, this plaque was actually unveiled with help from the Lakefield Historical Society that commemorates my great great grandfather, Moses Muscat Marston, as well as Curve Lake First Nation, just over in Head Point over there by the trailer park. Uh, and you can actually see that he also served in the First World War. He signed up to actually go to the 13th Battalion Marching Band, uh, but he actually, uh, I think he was too old. He was like 48 and they cut him off. So he's still part of the war effort, but he didn't actually serve active service. And again, I think this plaque obviously shows a very well-intentioned approach to Indigenous people uh, and their presence. But uh, unfortunately, a lot of the students that are from this area pick this plaque in particular as one that they think needs to be updated. I'm not calling anyone from the Historical Society out, but this is what I consider maybe adding something to. So uh, on Caroline Street, where my grandpa lives, I walk by this one quite often, just on the corner there. There is a rock that commemorates John uh, and Margaret Nelson. And if you read the plaque and go into it a little bit, um, it actually claims that this family was the very first family that ever lived in this area. And clearly, I don't think that was the case. It says, as a first family in this area, they pioneered settlement in which was become the village of Lakefield, which is true, but obviously, especially if you talk to May and other people who have done a lot of indigenous research in this area, there were families that have lived here for 10,000, 15,000, 20,000 years old. Uh, I think potentially we can go back to these sites and update them a little bit and add some more contacts. This was obviously made back in 2001, which I think not a lot of people were talking or thinking about indigenous people. Uh, and that's something that's going on right now as we speak. I've been working with Ontario Heritage Trust, the ones that make those blue plaques that you've seen everywhere. Uh, and they're basically reviewing all 1,400 of their plaques and updating them and changing them. So times, I would say, are changing, uh, but I would happy to talk to you more about that if you're interested in maybe updating and providing more context to these types of histories. Because we do realize that people that read plaques, especially those that aren't interested in history, that really is how you frame your mindset of our past and our history moving forward. So I'll wrap things up. Happy to answer any questions. Thank much for having me. Yes, no, the, the Chippewa are technically separate but under the Anishinaabeg. So it gets a little confusing. There's the Chippewa, the Odawa, and the Mississauga. Uh, and those are all technically separate nations that are under the banner of the Anishinaabeg. So um, related very closely to their languages, but a bit different than Chippewa. I, I thought maybe it was a uh, conscription language based on the European. Mm -hmm. You agree? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably, likewise, yeah, a lot of that. Missed here, I think. <laughs> Go to your question. Well, I first thing I'm from the Lakeville Historical Society. I want to thank you very much. It was very enlightening. And it's a small token from us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jackson. It's been very enlightening. I know that I learned a lot, and it's it's good to hear that half of history that we don't hear about. And certainly when I look at those, that fact that we put up for the uh, Nelson family, you're quite right. I mean, they may have been the first European settlers to be uh, in like, the area, but they certainly weren't the first settlers in the area. Uh, not by probably 11,000 years at least. <laughs> So that's something we can't think about. Obviously, by last year, we were starting to get the message. We, we still have a little bit to learn. This is our last meeting for this year. As you know, we don't meet in the winter months. Uh, 
So we wouldn't be meeting again until March. And Corey, what date are we meeting on? The last Thursday. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> the last Thursday. All right, well, we'll know by then when we're meeting and who's going to be talking. Uh, we have refreshments at the back. If you haven't uh, satisfied yourself already, please do and uh, talk to the people here. This is a time to get together and talk about our mutual history interest and what we can learn from each other. Passing along history is the secret to future. For if we forget history, we repeat the past. And we only have to look south of the border to see some of that potentially happening. But thank you all for coming, and I uh, wish you a good Merry Christmas and New Year, and we'll see you in March.